Our Chicago to Texas piggybacks run like the wind, covering 900 miles, 1,450 kilometers, in less than 36 hours. Shore Dock, 1985. Shippers complain that a load of freight can make its way from Los Angeles to Chicago in 48 hours, then take 30 hours to travel across the city. A recent trainload of sulfur took some 27 hours to pass through Chicago, an average speed of 1.13 miles per hour, 1.8 kilometers per hour, or about a quarter the pace of many electric wheelchairs. Freight train late? Blame Chicago. Chapter 21. Railroads Rationalized. 21.1. Rationalization. Nationalization style. By 1917, U.S. railroads, the country's largest industry, operated over 400,000 kilometers, 240,000 miles of track, and employed 1.8 million people. While the war was raging in Europe, war traffic was congesting America's railroads, especially at East Coast ports, even before the American Expeditionary Force went over there. The American Railway Association tried to coordinate its members' railroads to avoid car shortages. The Interstate Commerce Commission was granted greater powers to ensure efficiency, and that priority cargo received priority treatment. Yet the progress made by these organizations was insufficient. On December 28, the federal government's Director General of Railroads, William McAdoo, took control of the largest private railroads and placed them under the control of the United States Railroad Administration, USRA, a creature of Congress. Nationalization had more than a substance to it. Railroad employees were given military titles, and a few inter-railroad arrangements were forced on the properties. Some standardized locomotive designs were developed and engines were constructed. Labor arrangements were imposed that the railroads might not have agreed to under other circumstances. Railroads were granted compensation equal to their pre-war profits. The shipping cost per ton kilometer rose, however, in part due to a rise in wages. While the railroad regulatory regime clearly collapsed with the onset of World War I, the regulation initiatives of the late 1800s and the early 1900s worked for their times. They managed the gross inequities that worried the public. Government served as a referee for railroad rate-making disputes, and government had begun to assert its power over who gets the location transportation rents via maximum rate prescriptions. The list of problems that regulation did not manage remained long, of course. One of these was the vast difference in the economic fortunes of the different properties. This was not just a matter of concern to the managers, stockholders, and bondholders of the railroad that were not doing well. Shippers had interest in strong railroads, as did regional groups. They were worried about good, stable service. This chapter treats the notion of rationalization as attempted in several ways. The goal was efficiency, the means was often consolidation, but the shape suggested depended on the who was suggesting. 21.2 Rationalization, Congressional Style The Transportation Act of 1920 returned the railroads to private ownership. The debate in Congress went beyond the transfer of ownership to the problem of a viable system. It extended beyond the railroads to a general call for transportation improvements. It sought to improve the system rather than merely controlling its ills. The Act ordered waterway improvements and began what later became a remarkable renewal of inland waterway transport. The Highway Act of 1921 reflected the debate. The Transportation Act of 1920 directed the ICC to prepare a plan for the consolidation of all common carrier line haul railroads. It limited the number of systems to a few large systems of similar economic strength and overlapping turfs. Unlike the consolidation proposals that emerged in Britain and elsewhere at about the time, competition was to be preserved. In 1921, the British established four regional monopolies, the Great Western Railway, GWR, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, LMS, the London and Northeastern Railway, the LNER, and the Southern Railway, SR, which were subsequently nationalized in 1947. The ICC engaged railroad expert and Harvard professor W.Z. Ripley to produce a plan. After some revision by the ICC, a 21-system plan emerged in August 1921, and the ICC began to hold hearings on it. The 1920 Act had given the ICC authority to regulate construction and abandonment, and the agency was supposed to adhere to the plan. That planning was in the great man announcing results style, common at the time. However, Ripley's plan were not a win-win plan in the sense that all railroads would be better off if the plan were implemented. 21.3. 
The hearings on the 1921 proposed plan did not go smoothly, and a final plan was not adopted until 1929, just in time for the Great Depression. It, too, had 21 systems, but differed in that it excluded many small railroads and had different arrangements for the large ones. It never really had much effect and was abolished by the Transportation Act of 1940. The term rationalization is applied to the attempt of the 1920 Act. Rationalization has a lot of different meanings. Perhaps the sense of it is to change structure so as to get some desired behavior. The 1920 Act focused on spatial structure. Another sense of rationalization emerged in the activities of the Federal Coordinator of Transportation, Joseph Eastman. The Emergency Transportation Act of 1933 established his office. Eastman was to study rail transportation, identify economies, and recommend means for achieving them. Eastman's findings were to be submitted to regional committees for implementation, voluntarily, and the committees were made of railroad representatives. Eastman quickly realized that there was little promise in grand plans of the Ripley type imposed from the top. So, he put his energy into small improvements. In the main, consolidation of yards, terminals, or parallel routes here or there. He advocated pooling of cars, container-like service, and competition for the Railroad-Controlled Railway Express Agency. As expected from this voluntary structure, nothing happened. Even so, Eastman worked on the possibilities for consolidation of yards and terminals for which there were many options and the economies were quite clear. Nothing happened, yet Eastman felt so strongly about his proposal that he d discussed issuing an order for implementation. He had the power and this would make a strong case of challenge in the courts. Still nothing happened. It is said that he was blocked by rail labor, but railroads that would have been losers must have had a say in that. He was interested in consolidation of parallel routes but made no proposals. This made more sense later when the new signal systems came along. Eastman proposed pooling of cars, another idea ahead of its time. Finally, Eastman had very interesting merchandise traffic and intermodal ideas. He proposed the use of containers and where the traffic warranted unit, or one car, trains. He wanted more competition in merchandise service and the addition of servers to compete with the REA. When the Office of the Federal Coordinator was abolished in 1936, nothing had been accomplished. Perhaps this was because Eastman was an outsider. After all, by that time, the ICC, the railroads, and the interested congressional committees occupied the regulatory turf. He accomplished nothing, yet many of his ideas have subsequently been adopted. The introduction of the diesel locomotive, long trains, centralized traffic control, and the large hump sorting yard yielded another round of operations planning beginning in the late 1940s and continuing today. By and large, this work was done by the individual properties. Its results are clear from the ways in which operations have changed. It is also clear that some properties have succeeded better than others. 21.3. Rationalization, Commission Style The idea of Ripley-style railroad consolidation and the idea for Eastman's office came from Congress. We turn now to the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC. What was their idea of rationalization? The answer to that question is hard to ferret. The Interstate Commerce Act required the establishment of through routes as well as joint freight classifications and joint rates. The through route notion argues for moving freight in a spatially rational way. Why didn't the railroads do that? Lots of alternative routes between places were available. Let's move freight as far as we can on our own route, then let's give it to a friend who gives us freight. The ICC did three things. It used the shortest route to calculate cost and thus the tariff that would be charged. This is in the interest of efficiency. The tariff that can be charged encourages the railroads to move goods in a cost-effective way. Second, the ICC gave the shipper the right to specify the route over which freight would be moved. That gave the shipper control over the available service. The third thing was a bit more complicated. It has to do the way, with the way the friends are treated in the sense of the paragraph above. Early, it prohibited a railroad from discriminating among connecting lines, in those cases where the shipper does not specify routing. The question of how to identify discrimination was answered mainly through reference to historical patterns of handing off traffic. Next is the special case of when railroads merge. A variety of things were tried. The conditions imposed on the Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton Railroad required that traffic would flow after the merger just like it did before. Those conditions were made standard. That is, some sort of comment on what the ICC took rationalization to be. Efficiency must be an objective of a merger, and that surely has to do with traffic management and concentration. Yet the ICC gave more value to stability, preserving historic relationships. The Act of 1920 gave the ICC control over construction and abandonment, as mentioned. By that time, the network was pretty much in place, and other modes had begun to claim traffic. The 
although the ICC looked for the convenience and necessity of new services, in the main its experience had been with abandonment. Cost reductions result from abandoning routes. Maintaining a route ha- to be serviceable, even if unused, costs some money. Nature takes its toll on track and equipment. Did the ICC operationalize rationalization as the capturing of those savings? The answer is clearly yes, although one hears horror stories about the difficulties in getting permission to abandon track. The empirical record says that the ICC allowed just about all that were applied for, some big ones and numerous small ones. Some question that record. First, it costs money and takes management time to abandon routes, so we do not know about routes not abandoned because they were too costly to pursue. Second, following the Transportation Act of 1940, the ICC was required to give weight to the interests of carrier employees affected. Some conditions were worked out, and they were rather costly. These may have held down applications for mergers. 21.4. Rationalization, corporate style. Problems begging the rationalization of firms and routes remained, and they began to receive attention after World War II. The first phase ran until about 1970, and its focus was on the consolidation of regional services, the Ripley Thrust, reborn. Initiated by the rail properties, railroads acquired or merged with competing properties in their service areas. The Norfolk and Western, for example, acquired the Virginian, essentially a parallel coal hauler, in the Norfolk and Western service area. In this case, some redundant line was abandoned, and the Norfolk and Western obtained a lower-grade east-west line for heavy haul coal movements. Ripley wrote as if he were a czar who could stand back and manipulate the entire net. That was not a real option, however. Merger control was an option. Mergers were allowed when they were proposed by two or more railroads. The conditions imposed by the ICC varied over time. By 1940, they had to do with 1. The effect of the proposed merger on adequate transportation service. 2. The public interest effect of the inclusion or more often non-inclusion of railroads in the area served. 3. Costs. And 4. The interest of railroad employees. Item 1 was considered because mergers usually include abandonment items. Item 2 was almost always a question and costs should not swamp benefits, as per item 3. It is very difficult to judge the outcome of rationalization by merger policy. First, there was a long history of railroad mergers and consolidations. Did policies and variations on them make any difference? The process was expensive and lengthy. Often mergers had so many conditions on them that the economies proposed could never be achieved. Conditions had to do with the ability of the merger partners to alter their patterns. They may require that landlocked railroads be given track running rights. The data we have seen suggests that merged railroads as a class have done little better than they would have standing alone, but not as well as the merger proposal claimed. A large number of system changes emerged, with the largest during the ICC era being the merger of the New York Central and Pennsylvania systems, yielding the Penn Central. Even so, there was little payoff from the Penn Central and other mergers. The expected efficiencies were not realized. There were several reasons. First, the ICC often insisted that weak roads be included in mergers or acquisitions. In the Penn Central case, the New Haven and other weak railroads were included in the new system. Second, where there was redundant property and service as a result of mergers, the ICC was slow to allow abandonment. Third, the ICC insisted that previous traffic flow arrangements be honored, that is, the railroads had little control of the diversion of traffic to the more efficient routes available after mergers. Fourth, the merger took four years to complete. This era ended with the financial failure of the Penn Central, resulting in government takeover of the properties and the creation of Conrail. The ills facing railroads included lack of capital, low profits if any, excess physical plant, discussed in the case of low-density branch lines, and inability to achieve efficiency through consolidation of traffic flows. The solutions offered included more pricing freedom for railroads and a more hands-off role for the ICC in approving mergers and abandonment. As a result of changes in the view of the problem and its solution, Congress pressed for reduced regulation, the 1980 Staggers Act, and there was another round of network rationalization. There have been many end-to-end mergers of properties. Inaction has resulted in the bankruptcy of firms, such as the Rock Island and Milwaukee Road, and the sale of some of their assets to other rail properties. The Illinois Central Gulf provides an example of the spin-off of low-traffic routes. The Illinois Central was ultimately acquired by CN, the Canadian National Railway, in 1999. It is trimmed to a high-density north-south route by selling lines, serving collector, distributor, and or east-west services, to small operators. Mergers and acquisitions have redrawn the network map. Presently, a handful of major systems handle the vast majority of ton kilometers of freight moved. That's not to say that the number of railroads has decreased, though it has over the longer term, 
Rather, the size distribution has changed. Class 1 railroads are the largest in the United States, having annual operating revenues of at least $250 million. As the figure shows, there are fewer and fewer Class 1 railroads, but the total number has been relatively steady for the past few decades. Eleven North American railroads are Class 1, eight operate in the United States. While mergers and acquisitions decrease the number of large roads, the spin-off of shorter lines has increased the number of small roads. 21.5. Rationalization, Conrail Amtrak style. The railroads emerged from World War II in a strong cash position. This, plus the adoption of the diesel engine for line haul service and some labor productivity improvements tilted them toward a healthy financial position for some years. But strains emerged. Truck, waterway, and pipeline competition deepened. Passenger traffic eroded sharply with competition from air and intercity bus and auto service. The beginnings of the rust belt to sun belt trend began to be felt. Regulations slow price adjustments for inflation hurt. Finally, the ability of railroads to self-rationalize via mergers continued to be sharply constrained. Crises and reactions to them first came bit by bit. The Rail Passenger Service Act of 1970 created Amtrak and relieved the railroads of their obligations for passenger service. The railroads had already been gradually reducing service at the slow pace allowed by regulation. Though of national scope, this act was somewhat of a special law. One half or more of the service abandoned was Pennsylvania Railroad Service. The railroads were not all in agreement, and some railroads, such as the Santa Fe and the Southern, did not surrender service to Amtrak at the time. Next was the crisis of the bankrupt Northeastern Railroad Companies and the Rail Ra Regional Rail Reorganization Act of 1973, 3R, established the Consolidated Rail Corporation, Conrail. It provided grants for interim operations and for loans for rehabilitation of some properties elsewhere. The Stopgap 3R Act was followed in 1976 by the Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act, 4R. The 4R Act authorized $2.1 billion for Conrail. In addition, the Act had a Christmas tree character, something for everyone. Amtrak received money for its Northeast Corridor, and the Act assisted the railroads with abandonment of routes. Increased regulatory flexibility was called for, and the ICC was instructed to give more consideration of the financial health of the railroads and its rulings. A short timetable for merger decisions was prescribed. The four act, in our view, was a response to an emergency, plus some side payments to gain the support of all players. The connection between the side payments and the problem was loose, though the connection was in the right direction. 21.6 Rationalization, Iowa Style The mainline mileage of U.S. railroads peaked between 1920 and 1930 at about 400,000 kilometers, 240,000 miles. Today, there are about 160,000 kilometers, 100,000 miles. The main reason for the reduction is that a lot of redundant mileage was constructed. Of course, trucking made tracks redundant as well, since it was no longer necessary to have tracks so close to the customer. Some long routes were constructed in areas where the market was already well served. For example, the Milwaukee Road ran from Chicago to Seattle. At a smaller scale, many such lines were built in the Midwest. One force for overconstruction was the money that construction contractors could make. Examples illustrate the scope of abandonments and other forces at work. Iowa had about 16,000 kilometers or 10,000 miles of route at the turn of the century and now has about 9,300 kilometers or 5,800 miles. The temporal pace of line abandonment is shown in the figure. Much of Iowa's highly productive farmland and much of the agricultural land was near the railroad. Wagons were used to move the farm products to the railhead and the rail network then served as a collector system to move the products to yards and markets. Within state movements must have been evenly distributed across links of the network. That is in sharp contrast to today. About 12% of the route mileage handles 50% of the gross ton miles GTMs moved in the state, according from 1981. That, however, overstates the within state concentration case because about 62% of the GTMs are overhead traffic, traffic passing through the state, and overhead traffic was concentrated in the early days, though not as much as it is now. The reduction in route mileage is not unique to the United States. By 1960 to 1970, British Railways route mileage had reduced by about 35%, Swedish State Railways by about 20%, and the French National Railways by about 8%. Returning to downsizing in the Iowa example, what is the cause? The data supplied in the map are not very helpful in answering that question because they fail to relate downsizing to anything other than time. Things have changed a lot. The economy of Iowa has grown, demand has increased, farm population has declined sharply. More people lived on farms than in cities during the early decades of the period we are examining. This has concentrated the demand for final products in medium size and large cities. The mechanization of agriculture and improvements in seeds and fertilizers have yielded this, 
more product with less people results. The mechanization of the farm-to-market or farm-to-railroad interface was a major factor in changing the demand for low-traffic rail routes, of course. That is a long way to say that trucks came along and substituted for horse-drawn wagons. As roads and trucks were improved, truck service became competitive with rail over a range of about 500 miles, 800 kilometers, longer in the case of products such as grain, and collector-distributor rail lines became redundant. The auto, bus, and airplane proved competitive to rail passenger service, and demand for passenger service no longer supported low-density routes. That's the textbook explanation for the I.O. situation, and the same general explanation is used to explain most cases. However, passenger service has held on better in Europe than it has in the United States, largely because of government policies and the closer spacing of large cities in Europe. Some exceptions to the textbook explanation exist, mainly cases where routes were redundant when they were built. 21.7. Rationalization, Community Style Activities initiated in the 1970s included the accelerated abandonment of light-density track and the elimination of failed railways, as well as end-to-end mergers and acquisitions. The railroads began to identify lines they would abandon and those they might abandon in the future. The states were very concerned about disruptions of service, so Congress had the Federal Railroad Administration, FRA, develop a procedure and fund some straight rail planning activities. The FRA presence was high because the feds committed to transition funding to assist the states during a transition period. The states have now gone through several rounds of state rail planning, and it is fair to say that state transportation agencies have proved fast learners. They examine lines proposed for abandonment by railroads and consider the alternatives of abandonment or knitting devices for the continued operation of lines. Continued operation is contingent upon a benefit-cost study that scopes wider than the railroad's calculation of profitability. If there is potential for viability or some other reason to keep a line open, the states usually arrange for operation of the line by a short-line operator. Subsidy to the operator may be involved. State rail planning served its purpose. The railroads managed to spin off track of little value to them. The states figured out what was and wasn't worth saving and came up with action plans. Many of those plans did not lead to successful operations and adjustments were required. Even so, operators of short lines gained experience and the large railroads worked out ways to relate to short line operators. As a result, and although the states are still involved, to a large degree, state planning was so successful that it put itself out of business. Deals can be cut to create viable short lines without the involvement of state planning. The process for developing the state rail plans, as well as the content of the plans, was prescribed by the Federal Railroad Administration. This is another example of federal co-optation of what should be local planning. Even so, the contents of plans are influenced by what the states take to their be their chief problems. Traditional concerns have been grade crossings and safety and the effects of railroads on traffic in towns. Some state plans were influenced by these concerns. Proposals for line abandonment affected states very much, and concerns about the relationship between freight transportation, towns, and industries and major economic sectors influenced plans. Let's look briefly at modern abandonment analysis. As stated, there was a prescribed procedure established by the Rail Service Planning Office, the RSPO of the ICC, and an alternative established by the U.S. Railroad Association that was used in the Conrail area. Studies provided a description of the route. There was then treatment of the alternatives of continuation as is, continuation with subsidy, abandonment, acquisition of -of right-of-way for banking for future use, and so on. Rail revenues from the operation of alternatives were estimated and then compared with the avoidable cost of continued service. Avoidable costs included on-branch costs and off-branch costs. They generally include calculations of the cost that would be incurred to upgrade the line to a Class 1 facility, condition of track, ties, ballast, etc., for acceptable service. On nearly all branch lines, the avoidable cost is greater than the revenue. An additional calculation was made termed avoidable community impact. These impacts included the increased transportation cost if rail shippers were forced to use other modes, salary and wage shifts, and so on. This number was then compared with the difference between avoidable cost and revenue in a recommendation made about the future of the line. The rail planning activities focused on state DOTs on rail issues, and most have activities in the area. There was a healthy broadening impact on the agencies. However, state rail planning is now somewhat mooted because many of the urgently needed abandonments have been made. The big railroads continue to spin off thin traffic lines. Usually these lines have potential for viable operation by a low-cost operator. Because the railroads want to keep the traffic generated on the lines, they assist a low-cost operator entering the business. 21.8. Rationalization, L.A. style. 
the Alameda corridor. Rationalization does not just require reduction in route miles, it can also involve minor capacity additions as other routes are abandoned. The Alameda Corridor is a system of rail routes that connect the California ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach to downtown Los Angeles, 32 kilometers, 20 miles north. In the 1990s, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach became the busiest ports in the United States due to the enormous expansion in Pacific Rim trade. Los Angeles and Long Beach ports are first and second in the United States for container shipments, see the figure. In 2000, they were third in the world for container shipments behind Hong Kong and Singapore, though they have since slipped. Congestion on the rail routes slipped over onto highways because railroads had track on the streets. Additional freeway congestion resulted from container traffic. The Alameda Corridor Project aimed to increase efficiency and movement of cargo throughout the United States to overseas markets. The Southern California Association of Governments, SCAG, formed the Ports Advisory Committee, PAC, in October 1981 to improve highway and rail access. PAC members included local elected officials, representatives of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the railroads, the trucking industry, and the Los Angeles County Transportation Commission, LACTC. First, PAC dealt with the problems of highway access to the ports. The committee recommended numerous small-scale highway improvements, which were completed in 1982. The trains were consolidated on an upgraded Southern Pacific San Pedro branch right-of-way in 1984. The Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority, ACTA, was created in August 1989 by the cities of Long Beach and Los Angeles. A seven-member board representing the cities and ports of, Los of Long Beach and Los Angeles and the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA, governs ACTA. ACTA believed that the project was not going to be accomplished without federal intervention and invited congressmen and other elected officials to the ports to see the seriousness of the situation. Congress in 1995 identified the Alameda Corridor as a project of national significance, which secured federal funding for the project. Congress appropriated a loan of $57 million for the project in 1997. The United States Department of Transportation authorized a $400 million, 30-year loan for the project in 1998. The ports provided an additional $394 million. ACTA utilized the design-build process wherein a single firm was responsible for both the engineering and construction of the project, and the engineering wouldn't be finished before construction began. To finance the project, ACTA sold $1.2 billion in revenue bonds in January 1999, with additional funding from California state grants and sources administered by the Los Angeles Metropolitan Transportation Authority. The total financing package was approximately $2.43 billion. The loans, grants, and bonds will be repaid by user fees from the railroads ranging from $15 for a 20-foot and $30 for a 40-foot container. The constraints on user fees are competing modes. If the port raises fees for using the corridor, shippers will switch to trucks. The Alameda Corridor Project began operation on April 15, 2002, with 33 trains using the corridor. As of 2012, it served about 45 trains with almost 12,000 containers daily. It was estimated that 100 trains would use the corridor by the year 2020, but the current rate of growth does not look to meet that early forecast. As a consequence, there were problems with the financing. The $2.1 billion of debt has been downgraded. Markets are changing. Extrapolations of growth from the 1990s were not met in the 2000s. Perhaps there is a peak freight, just as there is a peak travel. The United Kingdom has already seen relative dematerialization of the economy, and the total freight shipped per person has declined since the 1990s peak. If the United States sees the same, the long-term growth in freight shipments will end, and the demand for new freight facilities will fall off. There will still be needs as markets move, but not the remorseless growth in tonnage the U.S. saw for about two centuries. The ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach in particular face further competitive pressure from U.S. West Coast ports, from ports in Canada and Mexico not subject to U.S. labor actions, and from a widened Panama Canal that may encourage more Pacific-originating ships to sail directly to southern and eastern U.S. ports. The new enlarged Panama Canal may usher in increased use of larger ships that play the role of movable warehouses, in addition to its impacts on movement patterns in the United States and elsewhere. That structural change is inducing behavioral change and enabling production and market change. New robotic technologies may encourage more localized production, as labor becomes a smaller share of production costs, and the advantages of cheap labor markets, for instance in China in the early 21st century, decline. Nevertheless, construction is underway to extend improvements, especially grade separations, eastward from downtown Los Angeles, the Alameda Corridor East, or ACE, project.
A similar project, the Brownsville West Rail Bypass Intermodal Bridge, a 13-kilometer or 8-mile bridge that avoids existing bottlenecks and aims to increase NAFTA, a North American Free Trade Agreement between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, trade carried by rail from 6% to 35%, opened in 2012, the first new rail border crossing in a century. 21.9. Rationalization Tracks or Wires the Dakota, Minnesota, and Eastern. The Dakota, Minnesota, and Eastern DM&E Railroad was formed in 1986 as a spin-off of tracks from the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. The C and then W was subsequently acquired by the Union Pacific Railroad in 1995. The DM&E had also acquired other connecting lines, reassembling much of the C and NW Railroad, which had been abandoned. It mainly serves the agricultural and ethanol industries. In 1997, the DM&E first proposed to build a line into the coal-rich Powder River Basin of Wyoming. If built, it would be the first significant new railroad built in the United States in a century since the Milwaukee Road of 1909. It intended to lay 416 kilometers, 260 miles of new track from Wyoming's Powder River Basin to connect to existing rail lines in South Dakota and then rebuild track across South Dakota and Minnesota. Does this proposal suggest any rejuvenation in the freight railroad sector? or is it a mere tweak on a mature network? The Powder River Basin project was initiated in February 1998 when the DM&E su submitted an application to the new Surface Transportation Board, STB, for the new track in southwestern South Dakota and northeastern Wyoming. This track would serve the low sulfur coal reserves and bring them quickly to market in the Midwest. The advantage of low sulfur coal is that it burns more cleanly than high sulfur coal. About 100 million tons of coal per year could be moved by the line, more than one-third of the coal mined in the Powder River Basin. The STB gave its approval in January 2002, almost four years later. To supplement this goal, DM&E acquired the connected Iowa, Chicago, and Eastern, ICNE, and IMRL, the I&M Rail Link Railroads, and is now the largest of the Class II railroads in the United States. However, the hurdles to building a new railroad are large. There is the $1.5 billion price tag, which is especially large considering the size of the DM&E itself. There are additional challenges. Getting the line approved has been no easy matter. In particular, getting approval for construction through the city of Rochester, home to the famous and politically powerful Mayo Clinic, has been contentious as the city is worried about a constant stream of coal trains running back and forth across the city. The Mayo Clinic has been pushing for the railroad to build a bypass around Rochester, this is a far cry from the days when Downs wanted train service and is a different reaction from that of most towns along the line, which believe the railroad will provide a benefit. Nevertheless, a number of lawsuits have been filed by the city of Rochester. Groups representing Native Americans in the basin have also filed lawsuits, arguing that historic sites and burial grounds will be crossed by the railroad. Farmers worry that coal will take precedence over grain, especially a problem in smaller communities where the line is a monopoly. The Powder River Basin is already served by lines of two Class I railroads. The Burlington Northern and the Union Pacific is a third line necessary or in the public interest. The DM&E was denied a multi-billion dollar loan from the Federal Railroad Administration in 2007, which cited the risks to taxpayers. The DM&E was acquired by the Canadian Pacific Railway in 2008. Despite its ownership by a major railroad, the CP, it could not find financing to construct the line indicating skeptical financial markets. The project was suspended in 2009. With recent shifts in U.S. energy preferences from coal to less expensive and less polluting natural gas, as of 2012, CP has deferred indefinitely plans to extend its rail network. The proposed project also begs the question of why coal can't be processed on site and the electricity sent back east. Certainly this would minimize transportation, and energy costs, as electricity weighs less than coal and high voltage lines are cheaper than track. This would have less environmental impacts in most places, though of course more in the basin itself. Capital costs for a new power plant construction would probably be less than the capital cost for a new railroad though. Twenty one point ten rationalization coming to peace with modal competition. The New York Air Brake Company, along with CSX, has developed an iron highway concept, see the figure, a 366-meter, 1,200-foot series of flat cars with an engine at each end. Linked by automatic couplers, hinged ramps in the middle of each train allows trucks to drive on and off. 
The market nation's vision may be characterized as a thin market. The train has operating characteristics permitting stopping here and there for pickup and discharge of a few units. The road rail, or as a competitor, sponsored by competing railroad Norfolk Southern, to the concept discussed here. The iron highway distributed power concept is a good one, and the train should have a good ratio of gross to tear weight. It might open a development path. 21.11, rationalization, laying a new path. There are many paths for freight transportation that might be followed. The path discussed might evolve in different directions, and it illustrates thinking about paths. The example to be used was considered seriously some years ago by a major railroad. Imagine moving bulk freight in the vehicle illustrated in the figure. It is, say, 5 meters wide and has a near square shape, which maximizes content versus structure requirements. It is not trained in coupled cars behind a locomotive, avoiding the requirements for strength and thus car weight imposed by training. A single car arrangement permits rolling downhill and increased recapture of potential energy from velocity or hill climbing. The body of the car sits inside the wheels for a low center of gravity. It could use steel wheel on steel plates, low rolling resistance, no flanges to rub, or run on gravel or asphalt surfaces. If the vehicle grossed at 100 tons, a 75 kilowatt or 100 horsepower diesel engine would suffice, likely less. The engine drives an alternator powering motors on each wheel. Clearly it could do much better than current practice. Low velocity, say 16 to 32 kilometers per hour, 10 to 20 miles per hour, avoids energy losses due to air resistance. Low velocity is acceptable. We have in mind the movement of low value bulk commodities and their value of time is low. It is the time from A to B that is of interest in the precision of schedule keeping that counts. Consider in the opening quote by Shordock, the Union Pacific Railroad is noted for running fast trains, and it does. 127 kilometers per hour is common. But by our calculation, 1,450 kilometers over 36 hours equals 40 kilometers per hour, and this is for priority rather than bulk freight. What's going on? Stops in yards, crew changes, waiting on sidings, and so forth. We imagine cars moving at relatively slow speeds, but moving from point to point without stopping and without buffer time in yards. The scheme is open to new technologies of many kinds, wire following and automation, no train operator needed, onboard, for instance, flywheel or offboard energy storage, flywheel, pump storage of water, alternative fuels, alternative propulsion devices, electrification of high density lines, new materials, and so on. These technologies would be within a system design where they could be very effective. The design or variations on it might be effective in many kinds of market niches and at different market scales. For example, if high throughput is required, cars could run on very short headways. Infrequent cars on simple guideways would do for low-density routes. Put another way, the design might develop on this pathway or that, depending on technology evolution, service requirements, and so on. To ensure safety, low speed avoids the need for grade separations. Velocity could be tailored to crossing situations. The proposal uses existing guideways, is quiet, and opens a path toward reduced energy use. The shipment of merchandise, general freight, poses a more difficult problem than the shipment of bulk. Yet, this bulk scheme may be a way to at least partially finesse the non-bulk shipment problem. Imagine a building design, say in the Bay Area. Specifications are written for windows, and they say when the windows are to be delivered. Rather than the designer looking up standard windows, the window designs are specific to the building, granting the designer more degrees of freedom. A local shop wins the bid. That shop, in tomorrow's world, has computer-controlled cutting and forming machinery. Rather than shipping windows from some distant factory, aluminum and glass are shipped in bulk and formed into windows on or near the construction site on an as-needed basis. For another example, wine is shipped in bulk and bottled locally on demand. We are suggesting that new forms of bulk shipment might combine with the computer and control revolution to produce more efficient and sustainable industry configurations. Although striving towards sustainability may reduce coal movements, today's coal movements might provide an opening market niche. In Appalachia, there are many medium-sized mines that are difficult to serve because of their small output. Ideally, as is the case in the western U.S., several unit trains are loaded at a mine daily, but many Appalachian mines do not produce enough coal for low-cost unit train service at the mine. Cars have to be collected, often over some distance, to yards for train makeup. At first, using power cars pushing today's rail cars a market niche might be found in Appalachia. That's blocked by high labor costs today, a minimum of two crew per train. But there are completely automated trains, 
for example in the Four Corners mining area, and automation might be feasible elsewhere. Short-line railroads serve many market niches and are not so burdened by crew costs. They might provide a place to start. The step between starting with conventional rail equipment and creating specially configured equipment and guideway, as in the figure, might be taken in a niche where vehicles are dedicated to service and not interchanges for haulage beyond the market niche. Such a niche might be at a gypsum mine, a cement plant, or where aggregate haulage is undertaken. There are already specialized aggregate haulage trains. Conventional tracks could be retained in the center of the guideway. The typical 5 meter width of the vehicles would pose a problem in places where bridge structures and tunnels limit clearance. We see no particular institutional or fiscal problems, except for the current railroad low rates of return that limit the capital available to railroads and labor contracts. These would impose some transition frictions. 21.12 Labor Rationalized Responding to situations from time to time, policies were developed and adopted that preserved labor rights in mergers and acquisitions. The roads agreed to that in earlier days when excess labor following a merger could be spun off through attrition. Now things have changed. For a variety of reasons, larger quantities of labor must be dealt with. There is the special problem of the short lines created when large roads abandon mileage. These short lines often can be profitable if paying local wages and not paying railroad wages, and using railroad job classifications. It wasn't so difficult to modify policy in favor of the short lines. But it has been difficult and has taken many years to modify policy in the case of mergers and acquisitions, and revised policy has been tied up in the courts. In 1991, the Supreme Court let railroads ignore their union contracts when completing mergers approved by federal regulators. The contract modifications responded to things changing, and it was permitted by the weakening power of labor unions and changing public attitudes about the railroads and unions. It took a long time, and it was costly. 21.13 Discussion This chapter focused on a particular aspect of planning, rationalization, to make the mode work better in current conditions. Toward the end of the 1800s, rationalization strived to control the behavior of the railroads and to bring behavior in line with common law norms. Subsequently, rationalization has meant many things. Changes in the network and the spans of control of firms, bringing prices in line with costs, route abandonment, in the discard of old and development of new service arrangements. The latest wisdom from the last quarter of the 20th century is that regulation isn't rational, deregulation is. Railroads would also point to several major post-regulation changes. New scheduling protocols focus on assembling trains more rationally based on the destination of cars and less on their weight. Railroads have introduced what they refer to as compensatory pricing, an economist referred to as Ramsey or inverse elasticity pricing. Ramsey pricing allows the railroads to charge more, not based on costs, which regulators demand, but based on willingness to pay of consumers, what the market will bear. This has been achieved with better information systems. Where do the rationalization efforts of the 20th century leave us? The good news is that there is a viable freight railroad system. The tonnage moved has increased, and although reduced in mileage, the physical infrastructure has improved in quality and capacity. Niche market railroads, for example, mine to port, coal, iron ore, are doing very well. They are a good target for automation and mark cost reductions. The bad news is that the larger systems are barely viable. The return on investment of the large railroads, while positive, is not large enough to cover the cost of capital. To that end, it requires federal subsidies for the United States private railroads to implement new technology such as positive train control, PTC technology, which uses sensors and computers to keep up with train locations and velocities, control velocity to allow passing, improving safety, and decreasing emissions. For a variety of reasons, this is not being deployed as quickly as was initially imagined. In some senses, this is the rail analog to intelligent transportation systems or next-gen air traffic control, the application of information technology to help, a perf help perfect an existing mode. Like ITS and next-gen, it is facing lots of practical difficulties. As with other modes, new environmental rules are being put in place to reduce particulate and CO2 emissions from locomotives.